Thank you so much for being here. My name is Courtney Gillardi. Welcome to Why Be Concerned About Wireless. This is a forum about actions taken here in Massachusetts, town votes in May, and legislative bills that we can all get behind and support regarding the wireless issue. Our goal is to share science, best practice, and policy, as well as how you can learn more, get involved in protecting your home, values as well as the health and safety of your family and community. Hi, my name is Amelia and I want to thank you for being here tonight and learning about the wireless harms issue. As a 12 year old, I didn't know anything about radio frequency radiation until a cell tower in my neighborhood started transmitting. My little sister, myself, my mom and my neighbors became injured by one. Thank you for getting involved, learning and caring about the issue as no one should be forced, as myself and my neighbors were, to choose between their home and their health. My name is Patricia Burke of Millis and Saytech International, and May 1st marks 1,000 days of Amelia and her family being sick and displaced by the 877 South Street Verizon cell tower. May 1st also marks the day that Sheffield and Great Barrington We'll take a vote on important town items related to wireless. May 3rd is the town meeting for Millis, May 4th for Upton, and May 4th is also when Lenox residents will vote on an unprotected wireless communications bylaw with mere 250 foot cell tower setbacks and an unprotected purpose statement that favors the wireless industry instead of people, homes, and property values. My name is Cece Doucette. I'm the Director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology. And before you vote, we want to offer you sound science and a deeper understanding of why we all need to be concerned about wireless in the form of cell towers outside our door. Tonight, we will share videos of world-renowned subject matter experts. Each of these experts have written letters and shared science with the Lennox Planning Board and generously offered to be a resource for free to the town of Lenox and assist them with the wireless bylaw rewrite. Sadly, these offerings were ignored. As someone who has educated towns about safer cell tower siding practices, I too have offered my expertise regarding best practices to the Lenox Planning Board, and I too was ignored. We speak at citizen forums like these to provide information to the public so you know what you can and should advocate for. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Mirren. I'm the co-founder of PT Theater Company and Hilltown Health, a grassroots uh, safe tech advocacy group just a little bit east in the hilltowns of Western Mass, Franklin County. And although the Lennox Planning Board has not been receptive to speaking um, with the experts or incorporating protective changes into the, Bible, into the bylaw, I do want to commend the local Tritown Health Department for learning about the wireless harm issue. Tritown Health brought CC Doucette and myself in to present a safer cell tower siting forum back in October 2020 when people began um, reporting symptoms in Pittsfield. Uh, Tritown Health also invited Dr. Ken Chamberlain to present to the health department, and that video is also available online to view. Tonight, we are also joined by Lori Woden of Upton and uh, Catherine Levin of Sheffield and Great Barrington to speak on those town warrants. Tonight, we'll be viewing expert videos, and then each of us will share an update about our towns, some of the exciting and positive efforts here in Massachusetts what you need to know about the upcoming votes and how you can get involved and stay involved with this important issue. We just learned tonight that there is a very important wireless safety bill being heard in the State House on Thursday, May 4th, and we will share with you how you can offer your testimony and support for that vital piece of Massachusetts legislation, which will be the first to report um, injuries and document injuries from wireless harms. After these community discussions, we will end our time with a video about wireless smart meters that Patricia has put together, an issue that everyone should know more about. 
A recording of this evening's presentation will be made available, and we look forward to sharing it with you as soon as possible. We want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here tonight and hope you learned something new and are inspired by citizen actions and efforts being taken in your town and throughout the Commonwealth. With that, let's settle in as we start the evening off with a short news clip from Spectrum News One on the cease and desist order issued last year by the Pittsfield Board of Health after they made a finding of injury and harm from the 877 South Street cell tower. We share this to let you know that many of us involved in the cell tower issue, including myself, um, we got involved because a loved one has been injured. We are the quote unquote canaries in the gold mine or coal mine. Uh, I, when I made a documentary about it, I called canary in a gold mine, uh, just referring to the trillion dollar industry that we're um, sort of up against. And uh, I hope you feel like you can listen, learn, take cautionary protective action and prevent further and future injuries to the people you love. After months of neighbors calling for action, the Pittsfield Board of Health voted unanimously Wednesday to send a cease and desist order to Verizon if the company doesn't address concerns over the cell tower at the top of Alma Street. This is a historic moment for health and safety of our neighborhood. Um, the board has always had the ability to do what is right, and now they have the will to do what is right. When we visited the neighborhood last spring, many residents said they were experiencing symptoms they never had before. This week, those issues are still around. My symptoms are ongoing and have worsened. Um, I never was one to have headaches before. I'm getting regular headaches ringing in the ears that is just... Um, it just gets in the way of everyday life. One family sold their home and moved out, and Courtney Gillardi and her family have been living out of a temporary cottage a few miles down the road for months to find relief. Last night when we came home from the meeting, my little one said, Mama, I actually don't remember what it's like to live in our own house, and it broke my heart to hear that from her. The Board of Health is giving Verizon seven days to begin discussions to turn off the tower before the cease and desist order will be issued. If they do have to send the order, the neighbors say they're prepared for what could be a lengthy legal battle. Our doctors, our scientists, there's an amazing team of attorneys. Um, we believe that we will be vindicated in court because the science is settled and it's on the side of those who are suffering. Win, lose, or draw, no matter what happens, we're going to be here. So you can bet we're going to be there to defend as much as we can. In a statement, Verizon says all their equipment at the cell tower site operates within the FCC's established health and safety standards. In Pittsfield, Matt Restaino, Spectrum News One. I want to thank you so much for sharing that video because that is at the intersection of where we're at and the crux of what we are learning about tonight. People are being harmed at levels well below the FCC's antiquated 1996 um, thermal standards that are not based on biomedical or biological harms. And so here we are with doctors treating people and diagnosing them with injuries um, from non-ionizing radiation from cell towers and calling to reduce exposures. And yet we have an industry that says because the tower is operating uh, within those levels, it's okay for it to continue. So here we are a year later and we are awaiting our court decision. Um, that should be handed down um, anytime now. And we have had so much support from our Board of Health as well as our Massachusetts Health Boards who wrote a really powerful amicus statement stating that even if there is a tower permit, um, Boards of Health do have the ability when they find that there are, are, is injury, when they find that there is a nuisance and a hazard that can affect the public health and safety, they have the ability to act. And so that is what is before the court right now, and we should have a ruling on that shortly. So I want to thank you for sharing that video. And the next video that we will be sharing is from Dr. Cindy Russell. This is a seven-minute clip on the biological mechanisms of harm. She presented it at a forum, What Environmental Health Leaders Need to Know About Wireless 
We hope that you find it educational um, and informational. She offered her expertise to Lennox um, and to Pittsfield, and she has been involved in several of the cases of microwave illness here in our neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Dr. Cindy Russell, Executive Director for Physicians for Safe Technology, and I'm here to give you a brief overview of the health effects of wireless technology. I'm a Stanford-trained physician, and I've studied environmental toxins through our local county medical association and the California Medical Association for over 25 years. I've worked on pesticides, flame retardants, bisphenol A, fracking chemicals, and other toxic exposures that affect our health. Most recently, I've been working on wireless technology. We're using more and more wireless devices, thus we're increasingly exposed to microwave radio frequency radiation, which surrounds us now on all sides. Physicians are becoming more concerned about the health effects of this technology, and in the last two years I've spoken at three physician conferences for continuing medical education on the health effects of wireless technology. How did I become interested in this topic? Well, when I learned of a proposal to place a cell tower in my daughter's school 10 years ago, I dove into the research, and I found out there were valid health concerns, and it was not such a good idea to put a cell tower in a school setting. And what I also learned was that wireless radiation passes through our bodies and all organisms. Wireless radiation is absorbed by anything that contains water, and we're 70% water. Note, you can't cook dry rice in a microwave oven. Wireless radiation can interfere with our cellular biological processes that are not heat related. And also we get exposed to a mix of artificial pulsed electromagnetic radiation frequencies at the same time. And this is very similar to the mix of chemical toxins that we're regularly exposed to and we cannot hear, see, or taste. And we're also electrical beings. Our brain, heart, nervous system, and endocrine system work through tiny electrical impulses that affect our molecules and membranes. It makes sense that electromagnetic radiation could harm us. There are seven decades of military and scientific studies that indicate wireless technology is biologically active and acts as an environmental and human toxin. And the effects are variable and they're nonlinear. There are differences in our genetics, our nutrition, toxic exposures that produce differences in how our bodies and our biology react to these wireless exposures. Is there a biologic mechanism of harm, people ask? Well, yes, it's oxidation. And the mechanism of toxicity of wireless frequencies is similar to that of many chemical toxins we're exposed to, including ionizing radiation. It is oxidation. 261 studies show that wireless radiation causes oxidative stress, which in turn causes inflammation. We know oxidative stress damages DNA, lipids, proteins, and membranes. Oxidative stress causes injury to nerve cells, heart cells, the immune system, the reproductive system, and the nervous system. Oxidative stress leads to inflammation and a host of chronic human diseases we commonly see now. There are both acute and long-term health effects. And acute effects occur shortly after exposure to a wireless device or a nearby cell tower. It's like an allergy. Those who are sensitive experience neurologic symptoms such as headaches, nausea, dizziness, irritability, memory loss, heart palpitations, insomnia, and fatigue. It's estimated that up to 30% of people are mildly electrosensitive, up to 5% of people have moderate symptoms and 0.65% of the population are unable to work or be around wireless devices at all and that adds up to about 2 million Americans. We know occupational exposure to military radar which is the same type of telecommunications we use now causes these same neurologic symptoms. Firefighters developed many of these symptoms when cell towers were placed on or near their fire stations and this led the International Association of Firefighters to develop a policy resolution in 2004 to successfully fight cell towers on fire stations. This is now codified in two California telecom bills, AB 57 and AB 537, that exempt fire stations from having cell towers due to health effects on firefighters. You may have heard about the Havana Syndrome. There are reports of incapacitating neurologic symptoms that were experienced in American and Canadian government officials stationed in Cuba in 2016, as well as China in 2018. More recently, similar attacks have been reported in Austria and Arlington, Virginia. A National Academy of Sciences report in 2020 concluded the symptoms are due to pulsed microwave radiation. The U.S. civilians can get Havana Syndrome too. This occurs when cell towers are placed close to homes or if someone is electrosensitive and near wireless devices. I'm working with a town back east fighting a cell tower place without proper notification. When the cell tower was turned on, 17 people living in the neighborhood near the cell tower developed the same neurologic symptoms. 
people are now moving out and deciding to sell their homes if they can. The long-term effects of a toxin, be it wireless technology or chemicals, occurs over time because the biologic damage is cumulative. Studies show that wireless radiation is associated with cancer, reproductive failure, including miscarriage, neurologic harm such as ADHD, cognitive decline, and memory impairment. Dr. Lee, a Kaiser physician and researcher, studied 913 pregnant women and measured everyday exposures to electromagnetic radiation. And they found a threefold increase in miscarriage in the highest tier of everyday exposures. It was an excellent study and without anyone refuting the results of the, or the methodology. A review of eight of 10 studies showed that neurobehavioral symptoms or cancer occurred in populations living in distances less than 500 meters or about 1,640 feet from cell tower base stations. A 10-year study of the third largest city in Brazil by the health department showed that within 1,600 feet of a cell tower, the rate of cancer increased by up to 17-fold, and those power density readings were well within the SEC guidelines. Edgar looked at a town in Bavaria and published his findings that showed a three-fold increase in malignancies if you lived five years near a cell tower that was within 400 meters or about 1,200 feet. Mayo in 2018 published his research examining the changes in neurologic function of students in two schools that had adjacent cell towers. One tower had five times higher power density but all within the FCC guidelines. He showed significant cognitive decline in the students near the higher powered cell tower after two years. Wildlife and insects are even more sensitive than we are and also adversely affected by cell towers. The FCC standards are outdated. They're based on short-term thermal heating, not on long-term biological effects. The FCC is being sued for its failure to reevaluate the health effects of wireless radio frequency radiation. We're still in a large experiment. We want to reap the benefits of technology while preserving human health and environmental health and well-being. Let's take precautions. Thank you. All too often, we don't hear from the doctors who are actually treating the everyday people who have been harmed by wireless radiation. I hope that that seven minute video gives you a good overview of what the symptoms are and what the science is behind the biological mechanisms of damage due to non-ionizing radiation. Um, with this, we're going to transition into a video from Dr. Kent Chamberlain and then Theodora Sperato of Environmental Health Trust and I'll let Patricia Burke introduce those. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kent Chamberlain was one of the experts involved in the bipartisan effort in New Hampshire to create a state's report on the health and environmental effects of 5G and wireless radiation. The committee issued 15 recommendations in November of 2020, including educating the public about risks, reducing exposures, taking actual radiation measurements, establishing setbacks, and protecting nature. The committee noted that safety assurances for 5G, quote, have come into question because of the thousand of peer-reviewed studies documenting deleterious health effects associated with radiation exposure. This was a very important development. The need for the state to act reinforces the issue of a regulatory gap at the federal level the FCC. The FCC has not justified why it is still relying on 1996 guidelines and why it hasn't responded to the peer-reviewed studies and recent developments like those that influence the New Hampshire Commission's decisions. The New Hampshire report's findings dovetail with the 2021 court ruling against the FCC, which we'll hear about later. Both Maine and Massachusetts have proposed bills before their legislatures to also form study commissions. And one way that citizens can get, can get involved is to propose commissions in their state, to share the New Hampshire Commission report with decision makers on both sides of the political aisle, and to support states that have formed study commissions and are holding hearings. For example, Amelia testified in New Hampshire about her family's experience in Pittsfield. So here's Courtney introducing Dr. Kent Chamberlain from a recent presentation. So um, we are going to begin with Dr. Kent Chamberlain while we wait for Dr. Paul Haru. And it is my pleasure to announce uh, that he is presenting. He is the immediate past chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of New Hampshire, where he taught and 
performed research in areas including radio frequency engineering and biomedical engineering. He is here tonight to tell us about his experience serving on the New Hampshire Commission tasked with exploring the health and environmental effects of wireless radiation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kent Chamberlain. Thank you, Courtney. And I think you can tell from the introduction that I'm not anti-high-tech at all. In fact, since leaving the university, I've been a founder in a high-tech uh, startup company. And when I joined the commission, was asked to join the commission, my view was that electromagnetic waves, what's the big deal? No problem. Uh, and found out pretty early on in the commission that that simply was not true. So if I came into the commission with a bias, it was for high tech. Now, the findings of the commission, that is that wireless radiation is harmful, that's the bad news. Uh, we love our cell phones. But the good news is that we, we can do a lot about it, but we have to recognize that there is a problem before we can move forward. By the way, this phone is in uh, airplane Wi-Fi mode, so it, uh, it, it uh, radiates a lot less than a, t a traditional cell phone. So uh, another thing I should tell you is that uh, kind of a conflict of interest statement. You're going to be hearing from a lot of people about this issue. In fact, you'll be hearing from the wireless industry that there is no harm. In fact, you've heard that already from exposure to wireless radiation. Uh, and so that I feel like I need to say, I'm not getting paid by anybody. I'm doing this for free because I have a message to deliver learned in the New Hampshire Commission that I feel everybody should know. So I, having said that, let's get on with the slides and let me show you what that commission was all about and what our findings were. So here we go. So uh, first thing is, what what is the commission, and what was why was it formed? Well, it was formed through a bipartisan legislation. And by the way, uh, these slides will be made available to you, and the hyperlinks are active. So if you want to see what that legislation looked like, you can simply click on that link once you get the slides. And so it was, you know, bipartisan, both houses of the legislature, and it was signed by our Republican governor. And uh, why was it formed? Well, the reason is that, that it was formed is because legislators were hearing from industry, man, there's no problem, you know, wireless radiation is harmless, yet they were hearing from their constituents that, nah, it's harmful, it's harming us. And here's the scientific proof to back it up. So legislators were getting information from both sides and they said, hey, the way to find out the truth in this matter is to form a bi bipartisan commission of experts who are unbiased because we're not going to pay them and industry is not going to pay them. So let's bring them on board. Um, I should also note that this is the first legislation that's been passed in the United States to look at this issue. But I've been contacted by other states, as I was told, I uh, was telling Congressman Thanedar, that they're interested in forming their own commission. So there, this is, there's going to be a lot of follow on on this. But for our commission, we passed the legislation to form the commission. And then well, we, we got 13 members out of it. And the uh, legislation that formed the commission was very specific about what type of expertise we needed to have on board. And so what we ended up with, as you can see on the slide, is we had people in medicine. We had you know, actually two of our two legislators in New Hampshire were medical doctors. So we had that physics, toxicology, electromagnetics, that was me, epidemiology, you can see that. But the bottom line is at the end, we had a commission comprised of experts that really had the expertise to answer the questions that were asked of that uh, of them. So how did we do that? Well, the first thing, as you, as you might imagine, which would, would make sense, was to look at the peer-reviewed papers, journals. And uh, you notice the word vetted there. So that's what we wanted to do also, is make sure that we were looking at quality publications and then you know, use them to draw our conclusions. So what happened is after looking at lots and lots of them, hundreds of them actually, we found that there were in, in a lot of top tier uh, journals. Now, I could talk, I could spend a whole <laughs> 20 minutes talking about how we vetted the journals, but we identified top tier journals and lots of them that identified the harm of wireless radiation. And the second point here is that it wasn't just a few uh, papers that we identified. We identified lots of them. In fact, over 90% of the papers that have been reviewed 
show harm from oxidative stress, and I'll say a little bit more about that too. So I'd like to address these two bullet items. Uh, the first is that there are lots of top tier journals that contain journal or articles that describe the harm associated with wireless radiation exposure. And the second bullet says that they're not in the minority. Those articles showing harm are not in the minority at all. They're in the majority, like 90%. So if anybody tells you that the only articles that show harm from wireless radiation are cherry picked from fringe journals, clearly they haven't done their homework. So that's one of the first things that we found in the commission. Lots of top tier journals that showed harm from wireless radiation. Now, I mentioned oxidative stress because that's considered the, to be the mechanism that causes harm from wireless radiation. Again, that could be a whole <laughs> hour or two to describe that connection. But these articles that I pointed out uh, above, they do show that the, the harm is oxidative stress. And oxidative stress creates free radicals. And that's something I think we've all heard about. We don't want free radicals. And so we eat blueberries and take the right supplements to lower our load of free radicals. Because one of the problems with free radicals is they create chronic inflammation, and that chronic inflammation leads to the diseases shown here. Now, this is just a, an abbreviated list of the diseases that can come about from an excess of free radicals leading to chronic inflammation. And if you click on any of those links, I only put down one link per disease, but you get a sense early on that these are top-notch journals, and they're describing some very nasty uh, problems, very nasty diseases. So we know the mechanism. We can see in the peer-reviewed journal that there are lots of documentation associating the harms of wireless radiation to these types of diseases. Now, after looking at these, one other thing that we, the commission, looked at to determine whether or not there was problems, we brought in experts. So we brought in for uh, experts in fields related to uh, the radiation exposure, wireless radiation, and harm. And of the nine experts we brought in, uh, only one of them said that there wasn't a problem with wireless radiation exposure. And not surprisingly, that one expert was from the telecommunications industry, was paid for by the telecommunications industry, and that was the only expert who was paid to present to our commission. So continuing with the processes, we, like I say, we early on found that there was a problem. So you say, well, why isn't the the FCC, why aren't the other agencies doing something about this? So we contacted them, as you might expect, and we asked them to come visit with the commission. Now, you would think that a formal state commission convened through bipartisan legislation and all that good stuff, you think that we would be able to bring somebody in from a, a commission, a federal commission, and that was not the case. We had email exchanges. They sent us to websites. We never got our questions answered. And I think that one of the later uh, speakers later on will talk about why that is the case. And right now, I'll simply say that we, the commission, tried to do what we could to bring them on board to find out why they weren't protecting us, and we never got anywhere with that. So we came up with a final report. That was in uh, November 20, uh, 2020, uh, actually November 1st, 2020. And our uh, report included, was uh, 390 pages. If you want to click on the link, you don't have to read the 390 pages. You can get you know 20 pages or so. You really get a good feel of, of what our recommendations were and what our findings were, because most of the report, as is true with most of reports of this type, it was appendices. So let's talk about some of those recommendations. Um, <laughs> these are five out of the 15. Issue a resol resolution. We, we, we felt that the, that the problem like this had to be attacked at the federal level. So we wanted to engage our federal delegation to do something about it. And I won't say that we struck out completely, but we were advised that that may not have may not prove to be the most fruitful approach. So we did some work on this at the state level. And we can talk more about that later in the questions and answers. Uh, we also wanted to engage federal agencies in developing safety uh, limits that will protect, and notice here, trees, plants, birds, insects, because something else the commission found is that wireless radiation is not only harmful to humans, particularly children, but also to the environment. 
to, to the birds and bees and the trees and all that. And so uh, this is a significant problem. In fact, if you put a cell tower around trees, you're going to see those trees in the vicinity degrade and then sometimes fairly quickly. So that was something else we thought maybe go to the uh, EPA for that. And we also wanted to come up with uh, uh, a setback. And so what we determined is that a 500 meter setback, which is 1,640 feet, if you were that far from a tower or farther, you were probably relatively safe from the radiation created by that tower. And we also wanted to come up with uh, an RF education uh, zones, or I'm sorry, safe zones in buildings. I don't have time to talk about electrosensitivity, but it's a very real thing. and it affects a substantial portion of our population and it, all indications are that an increasing number of people are going to be affected by electrosensitivity. And what that means for these people is they can't be in a room with a working cell phone or Wi-Fi. If they went into a room with a router, they would be in big trouble. They'd get sick and they would probably have to leave. Not probably, they would have to leave. So we felt on the commission that there should be safe zones in places, particularly schools and hospitals, government buildings, where people who are electrosensitive can go for some re reprieve, a refuge. And also we wanted to have the, uh, you know, we wanted to minimize exposure. Um, oh, and, uh, and, and also tell people how to minimize their own exposure. As I mentioned, by putting my phone in a Wi-Fi wi mode, I'm having far less exposure than if it were in the cellular mode. So there are lots of things you can do. You know, one of them is put policies in place that keep the, the cell towers out of people's backyards. But there are a lot of things that can be done, and we need to let people know what those things are. So education is a very big part of what we wanted to recommend, or what we did recommend. So you need to hear this i think no talk about what we found on the commission would be complete without talking about how the current gu guidelines were set i remain shocked every time i go through this so here's what happened so the limits were set in the 1980s and they're based on short-term studies when i say short term i'm talking about one hour or slightly less and this is as you can see they were based on eight rats and five monkeys. And you want to read more about it, they've got the reference right here. So the assumption was, is that the only harm that happens as a result of wireless radiation exposure is that it might heat you up and, and in the short term. So that was their starting assumption. So what they did to test that out and find out the level of exposure where that would happen is they took these rats and monkeys separately and they food deprived them. These are rats and monkeys that had been trained to push a lever to get food. So they were food deprived at the beginning. They then put them in an enclosure and kept ramping up their exposure to electromagnetic fields, kind of like putting them in a microwave oven and cranking up the power. And the level at which the rats and monkeys could no longer perform this simple of task of pushing a lever, even though they were you know, hungry, they, at the point at which they could no longer do that was determined as being the upper limit of exposure. I kid you not. And they then took that number and they divided it by 50 and they said that should be enough of a safety factor for the population in general. Those are the standards that are in place today. And it is ridiculous as that sounds. I mean, it's like asking somebody to smoke a pack of cigarettes and within an hour period of time, and if they live, you say, hey, cigarettes are safe. So these limits that I described, that are described on this slide, are what are in place for the 24 hour, the 24 seven exposure that we get today. I mean, it just seems to be totally ridiculous to be, I can imagine that most of you have the same opinion as you hear this. So concluding remarks, uh, the formal state commission comprised of unbiased experts formed through bipartisan legislation concluded that low level microwave radiation is harmful period to human health and the environment. 
And here's something that we're advocating. There are lots of great technologies out there, a lot of things we can do to protect people. Remember that when engineers like myself were asked to design these systems, we were never asked to minimize radiation. In fact, <laughs> we are, the main thing was to make these communicate effectively, and they do. They're incredible technology, but their radiation does harm people, and now we know how to reduce that, and so that should be pursued. And things like uh, and I'm very much an advocate of migrating to fiber. There are great examples of cities that have adopted fiber over wireless, and they've done just well with it. And I could go, <laughs> that again is another presentation on why fiber is so far superior to wire uh, wireless uh, solutions. And finally, my recommendation based upon what I know citizen to citizen from what i learned on that commission is that if you're in a position to protect the population from excessive wireless exposure please do so and that concludes my presentation and this is what we are asking our town leaders our legislators and everybody at every level of government from local to state to do is if you have the power to help protect people children elderly and everyone in between to please do that. This is such an important presentation. I'm so grateful to Dr. Kent Chamberlain for sharing his knowledge and expertise. And I think it's so important to remember that people are not anti-technology or afraid of technology. It's that people are legitimately harmed by technology when it's improperly cited. And that this technology was built without safety or health the FCC, they are not doctors, they are not scientists, they're not biologists or epidemiologists, they're not uh, toxicologists or pediatric neurologists like what we had to consult with for our children. Um, and so there's so much wisdom here. We really need to let uh, our town leaders and our legislators hear these presentations and learn. So thank you to Dr. Kent Chamberlain. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Theodora Scarato, Executive Director of um, Environmental Health Trust, and we are playing a video specifically from the first cease and desist um, forum that was in support of the Board of Health's action. We did a series of these videos when the board uh, initially um, issued the cease and desist against the 877 um, South Street Verizon Tower for um, creating harm after their 15 month investigation, they made a finding of harm and it rendered our homes uninhabitable due to the levels of RF radiation. We wanted to provide the public with the same information that um, the Board of Health had received in terms of making their decisions um, around this kind of historic um, decision to, to, to make this legal order. So I just wanted to share with you that this video um, is on the FCC litigation on the standards and is from um, that cease and desist video and we can make that available as well as all of the videos available to you. The, um, Patricia is going to introduce the video. So there are a number of towns in Massachusetts where voters are going to be invited to consider warrant items at their annual town meetings that draw attention to the fact that there was a court ruling against the FCC in 2021 that very few people actually know about. <laughs> um, the court ruled that the FCC's 2019 decision not to review its radio frequency radiation exposure limits was not evidence-based. Um, the Environmental Health Trust was one of the parties involved in the lawsuit. Um, so the next video is Theodore Scarato of Environmental Health Trust explaining a little bit more. And a little bit later on, we'll hear about how some of the Massachusetts residents are leveraging the court ruling against the FCC into local action plan. Environmental Health Trust, uh, Theodora Scarato. Uh, this is a leading think tank that promotes a healthier environment through research, education, and policy. EHT works with scientists, policymakers, teachers, parents, students um, to promote awareness of be best practices of the safer use of technology. Uh, Director Scarato has uh, presented at 
the community development board hearings on safer cell tower siting and cell tower setbacks here in Pittsfield, also to the um, Board of Health and has been a research, uh, resource for um, our Pittsfield Health Department on this issue. I want to thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much. So let me share my screen. Great. So I, when I first learned about this a decade ago, I thought for sure that the limits that we had would at least be somewhat safe. I had no idea that uh, there was such a lack of accountability at the federal level. So I'm thankful for all the presentations that have come before that can set me up for what I'm going to talk about, which is our lawsuit um, against the FCC, where we challenged uh, the FCC's determination that they didn't have to do a full review and update these limits, which were set in 1996, and as has been presented, um, are based on science from much, much earlier. So they don't protect against biological effects, uh, children's vulnerability. I mean, we didn't even have the science at the time when they decided that heat was the only harm. So to to start um, and to hop right in on what everyone has said, in 2019, the Federal Communications Commission, that's the entity in the United States that uh, has authority regarding regulations on cell tower, cell phone, Wi-Fi, and so forth, radiation, they made a decision not to update their limits. And there had been thousands of pages of scientific evidence expert evidence, uh, organizations filing recommendations that the FCC do launch a full review. However, the FCC decided that they didn't need to do a review, and we filed. Uh, the court decision was uh, issued in 2021, in August. The determination was that the FCC had ignored uh, evidence of long-term exposure, of children's vulnerability, the testimony of people who'd been injured, um, like the families in Pittsfield, and there were over 200 uh, testimonies uh, related to that, impacts to the developing brain and reproductive system, and there was also a complete failure to address environmental impacts. Uh, and you can go online to Environmental Health Trust and learn all about the lawsuit and all about all of these, these other issues. Um, but I wanted to focus on the Berkshire, uh, I, Berkshire Eagle uh, piece because I too, you know, there was this line in there that said, don't take it from us about how there's no evidence, take it from the National Cancer Institute, the World Health Organization, the EPA, and the National Toxicology Program, not to mention independent research. And I would have been right there thinking, well, of course, you know, you go to the National Cancer Institute page and it seems like there's no problem. It doesn't say in a big, you know, bold statement, hey, we haven't looked at this issue, but let me share with you a few things that I wish I had known um, and that I would love for everyone who's watching this to know. So let's start with the National Cancer Institute. The National Cancer Institute has not done any uh, review, systematic review or evaluation on the issue of cell tower, cell phone, uh, radiation at all. So. This is confirmed in several ways of which I'm going to share. Uh, Denise Ricciardi, who was on the call earlier, had written a letter to the National Cancer Institute. And in the New Hampshire State 5G State Commission, you can go in and see the email uh, communications between the New Hampshire Commission and the National Cancer Institute, in which they confirmed when she asked, what is the National Cancer Institute's opinion on the safety of 5G, 4G, and cell towers? That as a federal research agency, the National Cancer Institute is not involved in the regulation of radio frequency telecommunications infrastructure and devices, nor do we make recommendations for policies related to this technology. Our sister agencies, the FDA, as well as the FCC, retain responsibility for reviewing guidance on safety concerns and informing the public if these uh, circumstances change. Now, I had written the National Cancer In Institute earlier because uh, my local school board had told me the same thing. They said, well, the National Cancer Institute says it's safe. They say it right on their website. And I have documentation and letters where they communicate to me that neither the literature reviews 
nor the fact sheets make safety determinations. So as I'm going to be talking about, the, there has been no review of all of the research um, by any federal agency with expertise in, in health and environment. So let's look at also the World Health Organization. The link goes to the EMF project site. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but there's actually two entities at the World Health Organization. They're, it's under the umbrella of the WHO, but they are two separate entities. One entity is the EMF project. They have not done any reports, research reviews, or determinations since 1993. The Berkshire Eagle uh, uh, um, opinion piece goes to this page on 5G. And if you actually look at it and click on it and go to what is the WHO doing, they talk about how they are doing a review uh, that should be um, published in 2022. And if you continue to say, well, oh, they're doing a review. Well, when did they last do a review? It's actually 1993 that the World Health Organization EMF project last did a um, health risk assessment. Now there's all kinds of issues around conflicts of interest that I can't go into that have to do with this particular entity at the WHO. But remember that the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a under the WHO, did classify radiofrequency radiation as possibly carcinogenic to humans in 2011. And since then, numerous experts who actually served on the WHO, uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer, working uh, group, the scientists that got together to make that determination, have determined, determined that the uh, science uh, is uh, robust enough to determine that radiofrequency radiation is at least now a probable, if not a proven carcinogen. Dr. Uh, Christopher Portier, who's a retired director of the United States uh, Center for Environmental Health at the CDC, who served as an expert to the WHO and also retired director of the agency, US Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. He filed a report in a lawsuit uh, with a, um, uh, actually there are several people who have brain tumors they're alleging are from the uh, cell phones. And in this report, he states that the science is enough to determine that the probability is high. There's also uh, Dr. Leonard Hardell, um, who has is published many papers concluding that uh, radiofrequency radiation is a human carcinogen. So what of the EPA? Well, the EPA did have a robust review uh, research program that they were doing for many years. In fact, what I'm showing you is uh, slides from a presentation that they did to the FCC. They were developing safety limits for radiofrequency radiation, and they would be based on uh, health effects, uh, and they were fully defunded uh, from doing that. When the Telecom Act was passed in 1996, one of the most heavily lobbied bills uh, in the United States ever, I think. I, I think it's actually ever, certainly at the time. And they were fully defunded and the FCC, uh, as discussed, took on uh, the limits from industry groups. Now when you go to the EPA, it's actually all goes to the FCC. The entire, all the web pages were scrubbed, updated. They don't have any report that the EPA itself has done, but instead, simply parroting FCC language. Then we go to the um, a letter that the EPA wrote me, because I wrote the EPA and I asked them, you know, what, what is your stance? Have you made a determination? Because everyone seems to think you have. And I actually got a letter from attorney Leanne B. Veal. She's the director of the Radiation Protection Division of the Office of Radiation and Indoor Air at the EPA. And she said, the EPA's last review was in uh, 1984 and we don't have a mandate for radio frequency matters. And she answered all of my questions, basically saying, we haven't reviewed it, but we've made no determination. So what are the National Toxicology Program that was cited in the Berkshire Legal? Well, they looked at this issue with a $30 million animal study, and they were asked by the FDA to do that because there was no, uh, there was inadequate research on long-term exposure, and they were asked decades ago, they finally came out with their findings, which were that there is clear evidence 
of tumors in the hearts of male rats, some in the brains of male rats. There was uh, damage to the heart, and there was also DNA damage in uh, tissues of the mice and the rats. This is um, a quote from Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who filed a, a statement in one of the amicus briefs, and she said, overall, those National Toxicology Program findings demonstrate the potential for radiofrequency radiation to cause cancer in animals. And also, I don't have time to present all of this, but Dr. Leonard, I mean, Dr. Uh, Ronald Melnick, who led the design of the National Toxicology Program study, also uh, has published numerous uh, papers and given many presentations. You can go online to watch those, talking about how the study is important. It shows that there are non-thermal effects, and um, there needs to be uh, a reductions of exposure to protect the public. And this is Dr. Leonard Hardell. I, I don't have any time, so I'm just going to finish up and say the FDA that many people say, well, okay, not the National Toxicology Program, not the EPA, you know, not the WHO, but the FDA, they say it's safe. Well, the FDA recently wrote a mother in California who wrote the FDA asking, you know, I got this cell tower in front of my home. Is this safe? Show me the uh, show me where you determined it was safe. And I should add that the FCC actually we have a record of a lawyer writing back to this mother saying the FDA says it's safe, the WHO says it's safe. Then when asked, well, where are the reports? He couldn't find them. So then she wrote the FDA, who in the response said, the FDA does not regulate cell towers or cell tower radiation. Therefore, the FDA has no studies or information on cell towers to provide in response to your questions. And I would also just end with this University of Pittsburgh Law Review, uh, which came out last year. It's entitled, The FCC Keeps Letting Me Be, Why Radiofrequency Radiation Standards Have Failed to Keep Up with Technology. And uh, this is a discussion of the policy and the failure of these federal agencies to um, create safe guidelines that protect the public. And the this wasn't mentioned, so I had to mention the, the captured agency because this sort of ties all the pieces together. I mean, how did this happen? I know I asked myself, well, wait a minute. We're all using cell phones. There's cell towers everywhere. There's, you know, in my community, we're getting towers 30 feet from homes with no say, no notice, no nothing. This is happening across the, the country. And this Harvard report from 2015 documents how the wireless industry is using the tactics of big tobacco. Um, not only are they involved in the science, uh, but there is um, millions of dollars into Congress. The FCC is captured. We have former uh, industry leadership who is at the leadership of the FCC and actually paved the way for the situation we're in now. So I recommend that because they explain how we sort of got to where we are. And in conclusion, there's been no systematic review of the totality of evidence by any U.S. health or safety agency that's in our um, in our the court documents in our case. And also, if you listen to the hearing uh, in court, you can hear an inquiry where one of the judges is saying, "Well, where how how do you know that long-term exposure is safe? But where where is it? Where's the document? Where's Where's the report? And there was nothing that the FCC could provide except to say that they made that determination. But there was no report, a review of all of the science. So I won't read the quote, but um, you can go to Environmental Health Trust to learn more. And I, I thank you so much. I'm glad to answer any questions afterwards. I want to thank Theodora Scarato for that video and for her involvement both in Pittsfield and in Lenox and communities across the country and around the world um, advocating for safer cell tower, um, the federal limits to be much, much lower as well as in our local municipality um, setbacks and things that our communities do have municipal control over 
that can make a big difference on the health and well-being of a community. So next we have uh, Cecilia Doucette of Massachusetts for Safe Technology. Um, we just learned that we have a bill that will be heard on Thursday on the 4th and Cece is here to talk about that bill and how people can provide testimony um, and get involved with the legislation and the actions that Cece you have been involved with for over um, 10 years. So this is the, these legislative actions have been going on much longer than the Pittsfield cell tower. People have been being injured by wireless and calling for protections. Um, we, we were not the first one. Um, and I want to thank you for all the work that you do tirelessly on behalf of Massachusetts and all the communities you serve. Oh, thank you so much, Courtney. And um, again, my heart goes out to everybody who's fighting this battle from their own homes or borrowed homes when they can't stay in their own. So thank you also for working with your state representative, Patricia Farley Bouvier, to introduce this new bill that we have in Massachusetts. And it's to establish a registry of harm. Because when people like Courtney and her neighbors or those in the other communities that we've heard from over the years, when somebody's harmed, there's no place to log that information. So I'm going to do a screen share and take you out to the Massachusetts legislature um, where we will find this bill that's going to come up for public hearing on um, next week, Thursday. So I'm going to first do my screen share and show you a page that I built out in my research repository that's called Understanding EMFs. And this was my way of keeping information straight so I could find it later and, of course, share it with others. So if you go to Massachusetts for Safe Technology on our resources page, you will find a link for the Massachusetts EMF bills. And there are six bills that we have this session. One is to address smart meters and to get an opt out. And there's an emergency preamble on that. The next is to form a commission like New Hampshire did to investigate, also to protect children from handheld devices, and also to address wireless radiation inside the schools. And then this one here would make it so that people who are harmed by radio frequency radiation can ask for accommodations when they try to get out and about in society. And then this is the one that we want to take a look at now. This is House Bill 2158, an act recognizing electromagnetic sensitivity as a dangerous disease, dangerous to the public health, requiring inclusion in MAVEN, which is our state's tracking system, and establishing the Massachusetts EMS registry and requiring biennial reporting as part of population health trends. So, for example, during the pandemic, our um, towns could go into this MAVEN database and say, gosh, how many people have been affected by COVID or how many people have gotten sick from food poisoning during a certain period? We are asking that electromagnetic sensitivities be incorporated into this database and the system already exists. So it's not anything that's going to cost the state a lot of money to implement but it's now time to be able to track the radio frequency radiation illnesses that these infrastructures and personal devices are causing. So here we see that there's going to be a hearing scheduled for the 5th, I'm sorry, the 4th of May in the morning from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this afternoon, I reached out to the chairpersons so that we could ask for accommodations. And with the accommodations, we're asking that there's a big agenda of bills that will be heard during that four hour period. And we're asking that this bill go on the early side, if not first, so that those who are electromagnetically sensitive can spend as little amount of time testifying or waiting around to testify. So. This is the Joint Committee on Public Health. Senator Julian Sear is the chairman on the Senate side, and he is actually the sponsor of two of the other bills. And Marjorie Decker is the chair on the House side. So we have joint committees here in Massachusetts. 
And we have the other senators and state representatives listed here. So when we look over here and see that they have an upcoming hearing, this is the page that will allow people to come over here and register to speak. So they say that everybody needs to be registered for the Thursday hearing by the end of the day on Tuesday by 5 p.m. And those who don't sign up but want to testify are going to have to wait until the very end of the day. So please, if you would like to testify, do so. And they instruct us that individual testifying should limit their remarks to three minutes. And that's critically important because look at all these bills they've got to get through in one segment. So our bill is here. And if you're going to testify, please don't just wing it. Write your testimony out and practice it out loud several times so that you are sure you can deliver it within three minutes because otherwise they're going to have to cut you off. And that's always embarrassing for everybody. So I will be sending out a communique. And it says here, if you have accessibility needs, click here. And you can add into their comment box there if you need accommodations for radio frequency radiation, such that if you want to go to the state house that you would like to testify first so you can get in and get out without exposing yourself to too much radiation. Or if you want to testify via Zoom, if you have electrical sensitivities that prohibit you from being on the screen for very long, indicate that as well so that they can pull your name up soon. So I will be sending out, hopefully tomorrow, a MailChimp blast on this, and uh, we'll include the links to get to these pages here. So those are the bills that we have here in Massachusetts. And I just wanted to share that there are other bills that we become aware of. So we also have a page that you can get to through Massachusetts for Safe Technology on our resources page, bills in other states. So you can kind of scroll through and get courage that all these other states are also introducing bills or they have over the years and take a look at that and take some lessons learned and then we can all continue to learn together. But thank you to everybody who will take the time to send in a statement. Personal statements are what the legislators want to hear. Um, I could give talking points, but it's really much more impactful when you tell your own story. So thank you for the opportunity to share the bills with you today. Thank you so much, Cece, for being here tonight on short notice and sharing those efforts. I also put the Massachusetts for Safe Technology um, website okay. for people in the chat. And just to let them know, you, you do an amazing job of sending out regular communications, action alerts, um, events, forums such as these. And people can just click the um, join button on the top right hand side of that screen and it's an incredible resource not just for people in Massachusetts but for all over um, the country as well so thank you for having an amazing research uh, repository a great wealth of information and sharing your time and talents with us um, tonight wow. and always it's an honor Courtney and if anything we've done to can help to connect the dots for others by all means just reach out and let us know how we can help all thank right. you thank so you. much so Patricia will be speaking next on the warrants in her town. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was really inspired by the citizens petitions that the other towns did about holding the FCC accountable for addressing the court's remand, which they're going to talk about. But I wasn't certain that there would be support for questioning 5G in my town. So I took a slightly different approach in Millis. Um, when I saw the letters that the city of Pittsfield had sent to various decision makers, I decided to ask voters to ask the administration in Millis to send letters of concern about the FCC not addressing this court ruling, especially relative to the rollout of 5G and the impending rollout of wireless smart utility meters in Massachusetts. Um, I mailed two flyers to town residents in inserts in the local paper, which was pretty reasonable. And there are a lot more people in town now who are aware of this FCC lawsuit and also the smart meters. Um, even though I took my ideas to voters at the town meeting, Really, anyone can approach elected officials and various departments and organizations 
and asked for letters of concern about the fact that the FCC hasn't addressed this lawsuit. For example, bird watchers or you know parents groups who would be concerned about a tower on school properties. Um, and I think it's also very important to remember that the only way that the ruling against the FCC was able to be made by the court is because people took time to submit testimony and um, research. So especially when a submission becomes part of a public record, like at our Department of Public Utilities in Massachusetts, a seemingly small effort can really count. Um, and it's especially helpful if you don't have to go it alone. So working with the colleagues in other towns on these Massachusetts warrants has been a huge support. People can always help by posting and sharing on social media, writing letters to the editors, talking to your book club, every little bit helps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, do you wanna just share the name of the groups that you are involved with and how people can find out more about your town warrants? Oh, sure. Yes, I mostly work with um, Safe Tech International. I'm a writer and I have a blog there and write quite a few articles that are also republished. And um, what was the other question, Courtney? <laughs> um just how people can how people can be in contact with you in the name of your group so you do you do a lot of wonderful writing for safe tech international it's a wonderful website and a repository of um just fantastic historical resources of people who have been working on this issue um and how can people get in touch with you is there an email address uh i have a new one it's called safe tech at gmail.com safetechmillis at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you. Now we have Lori Woden of Upton, and she'll be talking about her town warrants. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Woden, right, speaking to you from Upton, Massachusetts, which is a small town in central Massachusetts, just south of the Mass Pike, around 495, near Hopkinton, Milford, Westboro, maybe towns you've more likely to have heard of. Our warrant article put forth by a group in town called Sustainable Upton, which is comprised of about 350 people, is just like Sheffield and Great Barrington's. In fact, I borrowed it from them. So like theirs, our article is, considered, is considering that any application that comes into town for wireless installations to be would be considered incomplete until the FCC makes a true and scientific update of their acceptable radiation standards based on all the peer reviewed independent studies and the 11,000 pages of testimony from the docket open showing harm. We do plan to amend the article to allow for waivers for areas of town where there is little or no cell service. All this matters for many reasons, but most immediately because we are being told that 5G small antennas need to be installed on telephone, light and utility poles in our rights of way just outside our homes, schools, and businesses. Without safety testing, we don't know the impact this can have on any of us, including babies, babies in utero, children, elders, immunocompromised people, and wildlife, including pollinators, which affects our food supply. Our town meeting is Thursday, May 4th, so may the 4th be with all of us, at 7 p.m. There are five ways up to nights and all of us can become informed about wireless technology. Local people can come to our second in-person forum Friday night tomorrow between 6 and 8 p.m. at United Parish Church on One Church Street right here in the center of town. This forum will feature Cecilia Doucette, who you just heard from, founder and director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology, an internationally recognized expert on safe technology and wireless education. For those who can come in person, our first forum, also featuring Ms. Doucette, was on Upton, is now on Upton's cable channel 192 and Upton's YouTube channel, which can be reached through the town's webpage YouTube symbol. Also, there is a shorter half hour interview with CC on Jan Lewis's show called Be My Guest. And although it is short, just half hour, it is packed with lots of information. Another way to become informed is by watching the documentary Generation Zapped or Jonathan's Canary in the Gold Mine, which are available through local libraries by opening a free Hoopla account on your library's webpage. There is also a terrific flyer which links to practically a full education on the issues 
along with all the science. If you click on the QR code, you will find additional valuable information to clarify the issues and to help you become more completely informed. That flyer can be found on Sustainable Upton's Facebook page or by emailing us at sustainableuptonma at gmail.com. You know, all those years ago in 1996, testing was being done to assess the effects generated by levels of radiation that would be done really more by like cell phones. But just as they were about to release the information at appropriate standards, funding was cut and all testing immediately stopped. Because of this, our government reverted to 1980 standards that was from the military and industry. All of this was based on thermal heating, as you've heard, and set cell phones against the head or the body. No thought was ever given at that time to ambient radiation or cumulative radiation, such as we have now. Or from multiple devices or cell towers. They didn't vision possibly large macro cell towers away at a far distance, but never towers at close range. And so a docket was open that took all that information and testimony from people and the lawsuit from the Environmental Health Trust did require them to update their standards, but they never, they said, we're going to update our standards by bringing forward the 1996 standards, which was a problem. Thankfully, they've been sued again. They lost again. They need to update the standards and they know it, but the rollout continues because they say there aren't resources to do that work, which is an enormous problem. Even telecom CEOs admit that they have no money given for testing. The biggest NIH study showed clear evidence of tumors around the heart and head. Now studies show cancer, DNA changes, sperm effect, and neurologic disease from cell towers from non-ionizing, non-heating radiation. How can we put them at close range when we already know the harm that they cause even at a distance? We hope that people take their opportunities to either come to our forum and then or to watch the other opportunities they have to find out about um, harms caused by wireless at home, and that they come out on May 4th and vote for our pause. We're calling it a pause on any new installations or upgrades in town so we can then work with our town's planning board and technology committee on our wireless bylaw. We need to create science-based, sensible setbacks and design standards. We also need to work with our select board on poll regulations as they can legislate how polls and rights of way are used. What I think we all want is safe and necessary infrastructure like fiber or like cable, not the over dense infrastructure towns are being told they need because it is easier and much more profitable for telecom companies, but far more harmful for us and the environment. So good luck to everybody. First week of May is gonna be a big week. Lori, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being a champion for safe technology. Thank you so much for just your really grounded um, presence and your really clear way of expressing complicated issues. You know, I really um, appreciate your advocacy and the work that you are doing and the inspiration um, that you took from uh, Catherine and Nina down in Great Barrington in Sheffield. And it just goes to show it just takes one person to do something that then inspires another town or another community to take action. And it just takes one person like yourself um, to then lead a group of 350 people to be educated on the wireless harms issue. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Now we're going to hand it over to Catherine Levin, who is representing um, Sheffield and Great Barrington, and she also has those town warrants that inspired um, Lori, and I'll hand it over to you. Hi there, everybody. I'm so glad to have heard um, everyone here tonight, and I'm so excited about the bill that's coming up. And it's like, it's true, this first week of May is fun-filled. We've got a lot going on. I'm telling you, all of us, all these towns. Um, so all of this started, you know, I have here one of these volumes from the court case of the Environmental Health Trust, Trust versus the FCC. There's 27 of these. 
You know, when I would go around to towns, I would talk to people and they would say, but there's no evidence. There's no evidence. And there's so much evidence. And there's so many people that are harmed and nobody knows about it. And what's appalling to me is that the FCC has been has, is saying that we don't have the money to do testing. They make they have plenty of money for lobbyists. So in my mind, it had to come from us. It, the solutions have to come from us putting our hands out and saying enough. And so what we've done in Sheffield and in Great Barrington is to just do um, our job as, as uh, citizens of our towns. And um, because in the Telecom Act 47 U.S. Code 332, uh, Section C7, a three, it says any decision by a state or local government or instrumentality thereof to deny a request to place, construct, or modify a personal wireless service facilities shall be in writing and supported by substantial evidence uh, contained in a written record. This is substantial evidence. We have substantial evidence. So with these 11,000 pages and 27 volumes, we've used that as our substantial evidence in our towns to say, here's a um, conditional requirement for all applicants, all applicants that come in. We're not saying we're against uh, uh, telecom. We're not against technology. We're not against anything. We just want to make sure it's safe. So once the FCC has uh, fulfilled this requirement that the, that the D.C. Circuit um, at mandated that they do and that they do all this work to prove to us that it's safe, once they do that, then we're happy to allow you to move forward. But, you know, right now I see all the, um, every place, the towns, the, 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 they're getting ready for the 5G. They're cutting the trees. They're getting containers up. It's like, it's happening. And I know people in Pittsfield harmed. I know people in New Lebanon harmed. I know people all over the Massachusetts who've been harmed just from 4G. So this is a place to start. And if we can start here and make it happen, it's good. And May 1st is our um, is our vote in both Sheffield. I just posted our website for uh, Safe Helps You. That's safe. That's the website Nina and I have. And um, please, you know, if you know people that live in Great Barrington, if you know people that live in Sheffield, tell them to go to their annual meetings on May 1st and show up. And uh, it's time for us to stand up. And, um, you know, they say 5G is for faster downloads, but it's not for the making of a phone call. And at what cost? You know, we have environmental pollution from all of this Wi-Fi. So when are we going to say it's enough? We want to protect our environment. We want to protect our pollinators. We want to protect our children. And if we do nothing, we're, we're complicit in it. So this is a way for me to at least feel like I'm doing something positive. The petition is a condition. You know, that is it. It's just all that needs to be done is for the FCC to complete the court mandated order. Once that is done and shows no harm, then applicants can move forward with other town requirements. We just do not want to be guinea pigs in this. And that's where we're, that's how we're doing this. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your care and your involvement, not just in Great Barrington in Sheffield, but the number of times you've come up to Lenox um, to speak and sometimes to come up to Lenox to speak only to be told that you can't speak, um, which has been a frustrating um, challenge in and of itself. 
But I loved that Catherine took a little red wagon with all 27 volumes and wheeled it into town hall and then gave our town leaders on a USB key all 27 volumes of harm so that there is no plausible deniability. We can't say when we don't, you know, we don't know that this caused harm. We have seen in other communities, mayors and leaders fully support a cell tower installation going in in a residential neighborhood because they genuinely, like most of us before we got involved, they didn't know about the harms. Once they learned about the harms, they said, okay, I've changed my mind. This is not a smart idea. Let's relocate the tower. Um, we just were informed that Theodora Scarato of Environmental Health Trust has hopped on the call. She has shared with me some brilliant news about some cell towers being relocated or removed. And perhaps um, after Jonathan speaks, um, she might want to say hello if I put her on the spot and give her a few minutes to ask about that now. So Catherine, thank you so much for being here for all your work and best of luck on Monday. And we've got Jonathan Miram of um, Hilltown Health and PT Theater Company, Canary in the Goldmine doing amazing things. We would, um, you are so inspiring to all of us and we'd love to hear efforts in the Hilltown, some best practices coming out of the communities your way and the work that you personally are doing um, in your community. So welcome Jonathan, thank you for being here. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks for including me. Um, yeah, I know this is sort of a, uh, it's a, as CC likes to say, a marathon, not a, not a sprint. And um, I think we kind of got lucky with the town of Shelburne out here. About three years ago, they, they updated their bylaws um, uh, once, and then they updated them again and included a 1,500-foot setback. Uh, from for cell towers, including um, you know quote, quote, small cells. So as you know, if, if you're aware of how small cells are set up, you know they'd be. In generally speaking, it's pretty hard to put a small cell tower, fifteen hundred foot feet from you know, uh, the house that's usually right next to it. So, you know, basically their their idea, the idea was to sort of if a telecom attorney was looking through their bylaw, you know, they might think twice about trying to. Um, get more infrastructure in there. Uh, we're kind of lucky out here. It's uh, a hilly terrain. It's um, and that means that sometimes there are situations where cell towers are not not that they're not causing harm, but they're at least situated often situated up on the top of hills, maybe where there's not as many people living um, and providing service, you know, more broadly. So there's not as much of a demand like. And then um, there might be in other situations, but basically, you know, since then uh, we were working with the town of Charlemont for quite a while, and now that sort of got to a point, and then was stalled, and now we're going to try again in the fall. Um, and meanwhile, you know, my actual day job is making theater, and so we made this um, documentary called Canary in a Gold Mine, uh, which I know uh, Theodora was very um, gracious in sort of hosting and helping make make uh, make the most of that recent appearance in DC at the DC Independent Film Festival. Now it's actually been selected by film festivals around the globe, which is exciting. Um, and the other news that I'll share that is sort of very local news, very local as in our house and the barn next door. Our theater company has had a vision for a long time of creating an arts and ecology center out here. Um, basically, you know, we're a touring company, but what would happen if we actually had our own space to rehearse and perform and bring people together? And um, happily, we were actually able to close on the 17 acres and barn uh, across the street last week. And also happily, we had language put into the deed um, of the immediate neighbor uh, about basically saying, you know, not more than one microwatt of microwave radiation can cross the property line the way, you know, you might have uh, noise ordinances written to deeds. Um, so that language, which was reviewed by Scott McCullough and Ken Chamberlain and others, um, is available. I'm happy to email it to, I'll put my email in the chat if you're curious about, you know, what kind of, because, you know, you don't have to just be buying a property to put language like that in, in your deed. You can put it on your own deed. You can go to your neighbors and say, hey, you know, I know it seems like you would just love to have a, a AT&T or Verizon pay you a large monthly uh, rental fee, but actually, you know, the greater likelihood is that if the cell tower gets placed next to your property, your property value is going to go down. So, you know, our vision here is to create 
you know, widen out the circle. So now there's like sort of 35 ish acres that are sort of relatively safe, but still, you know, a tower could go up uh, on another neighbor's uh, property. And this is kind of what, what people, my wife is on the more severe end of the electro uh, sensitive spectrum. So that, you know, if we invest all this money and credit create an art and ecology center, and then a cell tower goes up, you know, then what? So it's the same, everyone's in sort of a similar boat. Um, there's no easy answers, but one thing we're trying, and I'm again, happy to share any language or any insight into this is just, you know, starting to speak to the neighbors and say, Hey, you know, what about a restriction on your deed about wireless infrastructure? What about creating sort of a safe zone here in the hill towns? Um, so that's some of what's been going on here. And um, I will say like next week, there's a fun video, short video that we, that Theodora Scrato actually stars in um, that we made while we we're down in DC and it's sort of a shedding a little comedic light on um, what would happen if a longtime protester in in DC encountered an FCC staffer and got him to finally review the evidence. So that should be ready next week. We've been a little busy up here and um, uh, that'll be posted on Hilltown Health as well. I'll put all those links in the chat and Theodora, would you like to chime in? Uh, sure. I, I wasn't Thank you. Gosh, you you just are amazing and it did such an amazing job. It was really exciting to have um, Canary here in Washington, D.C. at the Independent Film Festival. And um, I'm thankful for that. And I'm only at the end of the movie, so I'm not sure I'm starring in it. I think it was <laughs> definitely all you. But um, so, uh, yeah, someone asked, could I talk about any news? Uh, well, we are definitely raising awareness on environmental impacts. So, um, you know, birds, bees, and trees, and we have a webinar next week uh, on Thursday. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, other than that, we are moving forward with strategies to hold the FCC accountable on this issue, and especially on impacts to the environment, impacts to human health as well. So everything that you're doing at the local level makes a huge difference. It is moving the needle and, you know, everyone get involved in this. So I'm just thankful for everything that all of you are doing. Thanks. Theodora, thank you so much for being here. You, you are such a bright light. Um, you're incredible powerhouse and you are unstoppable. Um, and I don't think you do ever stop. I think you work 24 seven on this issue. And um, you also shared some really great news about some cell tower removals um, this week. And I'm just wondering if you just want to mention those two, because they are especially for our Pittsfield community that has been injured and harmed. And we're going on day 1000 on May 1st. Um, these stories give us hope. Oh, sure. I can talk about that. So in our community, I'm in uh, the D.C. metro area in Montgomery County. Um, I've lived in P Prince George's, Montgomery. Anyway, here's where I am now. And what we found out, and actually the Parents Coalition uh, did this work preceding me, which was that the majority of cell towers were on schools with higher free lunches, um, but, you know, people that families that had higher free lunches and higher minority population. And there has been an effort here for it was before I got involved. So it's been over a decade of work raising awareness on the cell towers at the schools. So amidst that backdrop, whenever uh, cell towers would be proposed, there's more and more opposition to where the school board will not, you know, no one would vote yes on this because so many people were calling in. There was such an organized group of parents and people and neighbors and community that were saying, you know what? A school is not a place a cell tower should go. The county tried many times to sign things without it being a proper vote on video, but that didn't work. Uh, we had a lot of lawyers who are in the community working on it as well. So that never happened. So what ended up happening in this particular cell tower was that the tower had gone up, but like many schools, there was construction. And when there's construction, then you've got this tower, but it doesn't match the new construction. So they had to move the tower. Um, and because of the watchdog groups and the neighborhood that was absolutely furious about having a cell tower, the 
it became a situation where it had to be voted on by the board in order to move that tower. And they knew that that was not going to happen. So the tower came down because there was not that support for that community. And there was so much um, oversight and everyone, all eyes on the school board, all eyes on this tower. Were you really going to, you know, let it go forward or not? And it's kind of really exciting, actually. So the tower is down, the new, the new buildings being built, and there'll be no tower there. We have several more to go in terms of schools, but it does show the power of the community. When everyone speaks up, goes to meetings, I mean, writing emails. I actually got a personal email from one of the school board members on this. And, you know, they're hearing us so much that they're writing back, you know, and that this is actually a change because in the beginning, it was not like that. So. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to thank you for all the work that you've done in all of the communities. And also, you know, it was mentioned this is the um, the city of Pittsfield, the request uh, for the FCC to respond to the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals uh, mandate um, to look at the totality. And um, this is what Lori and some people are, you know, um, Patricia, they're asking uh, their towns. Uh, the governor of Wyoming, I think, was one of the people who had written to the FCC and said this was a 2021 court ruling and here we are now and nothing has happened. Um, and you uh, were in contact with our Pittsfield city councilors and gave them a wonderful, uh, wonderful starting point for these letters um, that got sent out to our state and local and federal um, delegation asking to do this work in any town can have access to these letters and any town can ask their planning board members or school board members to get involved and send these correct yes and in fact i got news that ohio an ohio representative just did it um so the more that at every level, local, village, city, state, that there are letters going into the FCC, the more that they are going to know that, you know, they need to, to do something and they need to do it right and that people are watching. Because a lot of what has happened here is because there hasn't been the kind of oversight that's needed. And also there hasn't been enough people aware of the issue, although this has been going on for decades, but you know, that now there's momentum. Now people are really coming into this issue, especially with all of the towers going up. And another thing that you were involved with is this is our electrosensitivity oh. resolution. I have framed it. So when I table at events, it's in a nice frame. But this is the Pittsfield, Massachusetts Electrosensitivity Day resolution that you helped us to write and our city councilors so graciously about a year ago, um, right after the cease and desist was withdrawn. Um, and we were very upset about that. We asked them to recognize um, electrosensitivity as an illness, uh, as an invisible disability, that um, we need to have more awareness, visibility, acceptance, equitable treatment, inclusion in society, um, and also we need uh, to avoid this non-consensual exposure from these cell towers that in our own homes, we can use hardwired as we are doing tonight, ethernet. We can have our phones again, um, hardwired. Um, but when a cell tower is up outside of our home, um, we don't consent to that radiation. It drove us from our home. It drives others from their homes um, and that any town um, you have a list on Environmental Health Trust, correct, of all of the towns and um, places that participate in recognizing uh, Electrosensitivity Day. I do. I really like making lists, and I think it's very important to show that your community is one of many states and cities that have done it. So that's also really helpful for anyone who's listening who wants to do this and take what um, Courtney's talking about to your own community is show all the communities that have already done it. Because then people are, you know, people are so afraid to lift a finger on this, the elected officials. This is like, here, you know, been done before. Let's move on. Let's do it. Let's now let's get on to the next thing. Same with getting a meter in your library getting a, a proclamation related to electrosensitivity or electromagnetic fields. Um, 
you know, or even a bill moving forward, um, but definitely a letter to the FCC. It is so needed that every official at every level of government know that the federal agencies are not doing their jobs and they need to do them. So thank you so much, because these are really actionable items that anybody at any level, like some people are afraid to talk at public meetings, and I totally understand that. Um, It takes a lot to get up in a a room of strangers and start talking about your personal symptoms. And and, um, so one thing that people can do, obviously, is that they can ask for proclamation, they can um, celebrate um, International EHS Day, they can um, write letters to have their legislators um, ask the FCC to do that court-ordered remand. These are things that all of us um, can do simply by sending an email and are very easy entry points to getting involved. Um, I want to talk for a moment about the Lennox wireless zoning bylaw because I'm also here um, representing Lennox. Um, I've been so inspired by the work that people have done in Pittsfield on our behalf. I was hoping that Lennox sharing a border would um, be inspired as well. And I know you have reached out to our town planners and shared with them vital information on best practices. I have a little postcard here. I know people probably can't quite see it, but. Um, this says demand protective setbacks, and it's a list, and I believe this was from Environmental Health Trust of, you know, Shelburne, Mass has 3,000 foot um, setbacks from schools, 1,500 foot uh, setbacks from homes, and no new wireless antennas in residential zones. We have Stockbridge um, and Great Barrington, 1,000 feet. Um, And then we have Bedford, New Hampshire, 750 feet from the nearest residentially zoned property. Um, And we have a list of communities where um, they are really looking at these protective wireless setbacks that Lennox right now has a bylaw that proposes them 250 feet with a variance to set them back 1.5 times the height of the tower. And as you know, our houses were around the 400 foot mark and we have people beyond us who are injured. And so these distances are just not protective. Um, and so we're asking that on May 4th, people come out to the Lennox town meeting and do so early and vote no once again on the Lennox wireless zoning bylaw, not because we don't want better telecommunications in our town or that we are somehow, you know, um, anti-technology people. We just want a better bylaw that does what the town says it wants it to do, which is provide the maximum municipal control and the least number of structures that are possible. We've had attorney Robert Berg, attorney Scott McAuliffe, um, attorney Andrew Campanelli review the bylaw and say that while it's off to a good start, um, there are several holes in it that um, the wireless industry can really easily take advantage of. Um, Also, there are best practices, Theodore, that you can probably share a little bit about, like having a strong protective purpose statement that favors health, well-being of people, view shed, environment, um, and well-being. Making sure, like in Pittsfield, we had this change because we were blindsided sending out notifications by certified mail, not just in the regular post, but making sure that there is return receipts, um, making sure that there are really good application criteria and zoning board decisions so that zoning board decisions are not arbitrary and capricious, carrying insurance, having bond for towers, Um, And then also having a regular two or three year safety review so that the structural, um, the integrity of the tower for fire and electrical, they are all up to code. So instead of just offering a permit as Lennox wants to do that goes along with the land, so the tower permit is as good for the life of, you know, the landowner and then can be um, brought on to the next person having regular reviews um, because these things do they safety codes fire codes things like that change and we and when we learn learn more we do better um, are there anything else Theodora that I'm missing in terms of things that a strong protective bylaw should have we have a report that has has all of these laws so we both have a website page But it's a good briefing that you can share that has links like it looks at like for every issue that you just talked about examples of communities that have done that that you can 
um, present to your community. And I know Physicians for Safe Technology also has a list, but I know that communities are working so hard at it, and it really is worth it. It is worth it to take the time to get all of those elements in place. There are too many communities where the applications are coming in and they don't have an ordinance and it becomes a real mess, especially, you know, as you know, when in, antennas start going up near homes. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing and to this wonderful group of, I just came on to see what was going on and I'm so impressed. <laughs> Well, thank you so much um, for being here and for being spontaneous and for sharing the wisdom of your, um, you know, what you're seeing in communities. I think sometimes here in some of our hill towns or more rural areas, we're pretty isolated from it. And so we don't think it could happen to us. And Odette Wilkins had a great quote um, that she shared with the Berkshire Eagle on one of the forums and it never got printed. And it said, you know, some people say that, um, you know, why should we worry about the densification of these towers? Because if you look at larger cities like New York, where Odette is working in, it, you know, people aren't being harmed. It's not a problem. And she said, I, I want to let you know people are being harmed and it is a problem. Um, and people are coming to the country here to get away from the densification. And we want to protect our resources, our homes, our health. It's very expensive to pick up and buy a house. Um, we, we're running out of places to live if Lennox doesn't pass this protective wireless zoning bylaw. Um, and we know that there are amazing resources out there um, for our towns to be connected and protected, to be able to um, have the wireless that they need, but also do it in really responsible ways that the bylaw becomes very durable. And if it is up for a legal challenge, then they have a leg to stand on because we've seen too many towns, um, you know, the wireless company says, we're gonna sue you. And because of the threat of the litigation, they just fold. And that to me is, um, heartbreaking that, um, you know, our bylaws need to be so strong that we can believe in them. And if there's an inappropriately cited tower, we can say no to it. And if there's an appropriately cited tower, we can say yes to it. So with that, Amelia is here and she has a statement that she would like to read. This is a, a message of hope. So today marks 995 days of us being sick or displaced due to the Verizon cell tower. Nearly two years ago for Mental Health Awareness Month at Open Comment, I addressed Mayor Tyre and counselors about a 15-year-old girl who was made sick from wireless radiation, who was working with her school counselor to get accommodations. But after two years, when the pain of physical symptoms and the anguish of ridicule by her teachers and others who were educated about her illness, but chose not to take or any action, she died by suicide. She was 13 when she first got sick. Tonight, I'm here to tell you a different story about another 13-year-old girl diagnosed with EHS. She wished to share a message of hope with other sufferers, to tell leaders, teachers, community members, and those who can make a difference to please keep advocating for those with this condition because she won her five-year battle and others can too. These are her words. I am a 13-year-old girl with EHS. I have headaches, insomnia, and other symptoms sometimes when exposed to Wi-Fi or other kinds of electromagnetic fields. These can become very severe. Maybe I would be doubtful too if I hadn't felt the effects firsthand. EHS has dramatically affected my life but people fought for me, comforted me, and welcomed me, despite how weird my situation may have been. These people were my family, my friends, teachers, and sometimes near strangers. And they didn't just fight for me, but for anyone and everyone with EHS. They are the people we need more of, those with open minds and hearts. Thank you to all of them. If you have EHS and are struggling to stay in good health, or can't go to school or work, don't give up because everything will get better. People are becoming more aware of this condition and even if right now it seems nothing will ever change, it already is. I share her words with you to inspire what is possible. I share our story to remind you it is people like you who can and are making a difference. 
It took five years for her victory, but she got there because of the good people fighting for her. Thank you to our Pittsfield community, Board of Health, Massachusetts Health Boards, and counselors for being the good people fighting for us. We know solutions for the Ward 4 residents of Pittsfield are possible. We know solutions for all of Massachusetts are possible because each of you here, we know solutions for all of us are possible. Please get involved, have hope, and know that you, through your actions and efforts, are making a difference. Thank you. We wanted to share that we recently received an email from Erica Mallory Blythe, who is um, a physician out in the UK, doing incredible work out there. And this was a UK victory. Um, and like Theodora shared um, some of the stories of the tower removals and the awareness and the efforts, we also want to let people know that every little thing that they do makes a tremendous difference and a ripple effect. And we hope that one day, Amelia will be sharing her story as a 12 year old girl who is diagnosed with EHS um, and that she too can return home and have a victory um, because of the work of every single one of you and that um, we prevent inappropriately cited installations going up in our communities because of every single one of you. Um, I think we are going to transition on to Patricia has uh, some information on a smart meter. Um, smart meters are wireless devices put on houses. It's a form of non-consensual um, ionizing radiation and that Massachusetts is starting to face this issue and that there is a Massachusetts bill for smart meters as well. And she's prepared a short video for those who would like to stay on the call and listen to it. Um, and I just want to thank you, each and every one of you, for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so investor-owned utilities in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island have nearly completed the process of gaining approval for the rollout of wireless smart utility meters in the near future, which is going to dramatically impact the radio frequency environment in the two states. Researcher Dr. Beatrice Golem is renowned for her work in environmental illness, including Gulf War and Havana Syndrome. And according to her research, the installation of a smart meter is the most frequently reported variable associated with the onset of microwave illness or sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. So this is an overview of the smart meter issue, especially as it, review, it relates to the FCC court case loss and it addresses the phenomenon of mercenary tobacco science. The Rhode Island Public Utility Commission is still accepting public testimony over its planned deployment. So an immediate action that the community can take is to send testimony to the Rhode Island Public Utilities Commission, encouraging the state to hold the FCC accountable for meeting the court's remand before investing in wireless smart meters. So here's the video. The FCC lawsuit versus tobacco science for smart meters. Remember how we used to smoke on airplanes and hospitals and restaurants? It went on for years, in part due to tobacco science. Concerns about wireless technology and safety are catching the public and decision makers off guard. For example, the story of the Pittsfield Verizon Tower injury cluster has received limited balanced news coverage. In 2021, the FCC lost a lawsuit about its reliance on 1996 safety guidelines. The U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. ruled that the FCC's decision not to reassess the adequacy of 1996 guidelines was arbitrary, capricious, and not evidence-based. One of the court's concerns was the relevance of the guidelines for children. Children are not miniature adults. They have smaller, thinner bones, higher water content, their cells are multiplying more rapidly, and they have less developed immune systems. Based on a theory that only heat causes harm and that only human health needs protection, radio frequency radiation safety is tested by taking the internal temperature of a large plastic dummy filled with something similar to jello. 
The dummy's measurements are based on a male military recruit's head, which means that guidelines and testing aren't doing a good job of protecting children. We have not even considered protecting the nature environment, which also concerned the court. Through no fault of their own, most ratepayers are unfamiliar with smart meter issues. Every year, journalism schools across the country compile a list of the most censored news stories in the mainstream media, and Project Censored identified smart meters as an issue dating back to 2014. What is a smart meter? Grab a seat and let's have a smoke, because part of the story is that we're going to look at the link between tobacco science and smart meters. But first, a bit of history. Hurricane Sandy was the deadliest, most destructive storm of the 2012 Atlantic hurricane season, impacting the entire eastern seaboard. The storm was one factor that fueled the frenzied narrative about smart meters. The idea is that smart meters would add renewables to the grid and that price points and remote control of household appliances would help balance supply and demand. But the idea that the two-way wirelessly connected electric grid would result in a more robust and reliable electricity supply and help defend against climate did not work out as planned. The meters do not withstand the effects of floods, rainstorms, snow, mudslides, wind, and fires. And speaking of fires, fires have occurred where the meters were installed, including fatalities in California and Texas. Even as recently as 2022, another smart meter fire, and there is a lack of transparency about the fire issue. A wirelessly controlled grid has been described as a disaster waiting to happen due to hacking and security issues. Bills go up when smart meters are installed. In April of 2023, a reporter interviewed electrical engineer Bill Bathgate, quote, Smart meters emit excessive levels of EMF radiation, harm the environment by consuming energy, unlike analog meters, are programmed to overcharge consumers, and are vulnerable to cyber attack. In addition to increased exposure to radio frequency radiation, the meters introduce high voltage transients onto the household wiring, as described by epidemiologist Sam Milhan. In their 2017 compliance report, California's PG&E reported zero energy savings from smart meters. As reported in October of 2022, 97% of smart meters failed to provide promised customer benefits. Groups from all sides of the political divide have raised issues about the smart meters for many good reasons, like this UK organization, that describe smart meters as an unjustified, over-engineered, expensive mistake. Concerns include cost, privacy, security, fire safety, planned obsolescence, clean washing, and health. The 2017 documentary film, Take Back Your Power, is available for streaming free of charge. But perhaps the most important concern is the issue of health and the increasing exposure to pulsed microwave radiation, especially within a mesh network where the meters are constantly chattering. Reports of illness followed when smart meters were installed, including the onset of life-altering disability. Early reports of harm should have been investigated. Instead, the meters were measured to see if the transmissions were within FCC guidelines. This is the same thing as claiming that a car accident victim isn't hurt because the crash test dummy is intact. The company proposing smart meters in Rhode Island submitted customer education materials used in Pennsylvania. The flyer states, quote, our meters typically transmit only a few minutes per day and not continuously. A California law judge ordered investor-owned utilities to document how many times a smart meter was scheduled to transmit during a 24-hour period. While only six pulses may be for reading the meter data, the average number of pulses was 10,000, ranging to 190,000. FCC guidelines came from the military's use of radar, 
for a six foot, 200 pound man for injury caused by heating for 30 minutes for a single device. FCC guidelines do not protect against non-thermal effects, pulse signals, peak exposures, simultaneous sources, cumulative effects, and vulnerable populations, all risk factors amplified by smart meter deployments. The FCC guidelines average pulses. This is like averaging the space between the sledgehammer blows along with the hits. The body reacts to the actual peak exposures. Weren't smart meters pre-market safety tested? Here we see field testing of meter banks with no houses and no people. Testing is equated with measuring readings against the FCC guidelines, which the court found to be not evidence-based in 2021. Instead of biologically-based safety testing and investigation of harm by independent medical experts, the industry, its partners, and regulators use inanimate engineering modeling and mercenary scientists. This created a perfect storm because eventually the true harm of the technology would become apparent as it has with tobacco, asbestos, lead paint, and other products once assumed to be safe. We have excellent guidance from the World Health Organization about tactics employed by the tobacco industry. When a person providing smart meter health expertise also works for the tobacco industry, that person is a tobacco scientist. In 2016, the Center for Public Integrity published a series, Science for Sale, about mercenary science. Peter Wahlberg's product defense is featured in the article, Meet the Rented White Coats Who Defend Toxic Chemicals. He, along with lawyer Evan Nelson, came up with a scheme to defend the asbestos industry by shifting the blame from esotheliomia to tobacco. Nelson was fired from his firm. Another article referenced Wahlberg's role in discounting the significance of 33 individuals in McCollum Lake who developed brain tumors as a result of chemical damping by Dow. Peter Wahlberg provided public relations and or expert testimony about smart meter health safety in Maryland, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Vermont, and Michigan. States that did not use Valberg and Gradient used another product defense firm, Exponent, to override health concerns and complaints about advanced metering infrastructure, or smart meters. As a result of the investigation into the deadly San Bruno gas explosion in California, emails between the utilities and the California Public Utilities Commission were released to the public. The emails indicated that Navigant was suppressing evidence of deployment problems for Texas while the structure group was helping regulators, quote unquote, put out fires in California regarding smart meter complaints from high bills to health harm. In 2012, the National Conference of State Legislators promoted the opinions of mercenary scientists to justify smart meter safety. Falberg was referenced inaccurately stating that the International Agency for Research on Cancer had not found any adverse effects of RF exposures. The IRAC had in fact classified radio frequency exposure as a class 2B possible human carcinogen in 2011. This is an example of mercenary science in action at the federal level. The burden has landed on the public to monitor the integrity of expert testimony. The Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities has come under tremendous scrutiny regarding the MBTA commuter rail. The DPU has relied on product defense by gradient for many utility infrastructure projects from power lines to substations. This complaint to the DPU about compromised testimony by Wahlberg dates back to 2003. In its 2014 smart meter proceeding, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities grossly misrepresented FCC exposure limits as protective of both thermal and non-thermal impacts of radio frequency exposures. The August 2021 court decision against the FCC correctly identified the scope of the limits as excluding non-thermal impacts. This is an alarming falsehood to be promoted by a state telecom regulator. 
In addition to nearly two decades of complaints about Wahlberg, Massachusetts residents reported issues with the National Grid Smart Meter Pilot Program and post on the Worcester community documenting inaccurate accounting of costs and benefits. What happens when smart meter safety science comes from mercenary tobacco scientists? Symptoms were immediately reported across the country when the meters were installed. Sleep interference and adverse impact on melatonin production is one effect of RF exposure. Uninformed citizens and their healthcare providers may not realize that symptoms may be directly related to an environmental exposure. Research is mounting about adverse effects of radio frequency radiation, including impacts on the heart, brain, reproduction, and immunity, including sleep. When a community becomes permeated with wireless transmissions, providing an opt-out meter for a fee is the equivalent of surcharging for light cigarettes, which supposedly had less tar and nicotine, but in fact were not safer and did not protect others from secondhand smoke. Should we be surprised to see tobacco industry strategies for smart meters? Inanimate modeling and tobacco science are not appropriate safety and health testing. They are product defense. The 2021 court ruling against the FCC for its failure to review 1996 exposure guidelines is a kindling point. Like a smart meter or a cell tower, it can ignite an inferno of informed, engaged activism. Our vigilance, protective presence, and demand for integrity are needed to restore balance, coherence, harmony, and health to our communities, homes, families, the nature environment, and our lives. Thank you to everyone for working for safer technology. Thank you so much for that video, Patricia, for educating us about smart meters and why um, we should care about this form of wireless radiation. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here on this call tonight for learning about these issues and for becoming an educator and an advocate voting in the May um, town um, uh, for the town warrants and for the town bylaw here in Lenox and for protecting your home, your health and your community. Um, there are amazing resources at Environmental Health Trust, Massachusetts for Safe Technology. Uh, Jonathan put his um, information in the chat as well for um, PT Theater, their barn raising, um, Hilltown Health, and all of our groups here are available. They're all listed on Massachusetts for Safe Technology. So thank you for being here on this Thursday night and getting involved and have a good evening. <laughs>